so Rex, this uh, cover photograph is from? That's from uh, 1975. That's the first time we saw the whalers. Uh, first time we saw? First time we ever saw the whaling fleet uh, was that photograph. That's the first time we were approaching them. The thing is, when, when Greenpeace was starting, what we wanted to do was we wanted to create an environmental movement. We thought, well, you know, there's a civil rights movement, there's a women's movement, this is all great, but there needs to be an environmental movement. We weren't really thinking of starting an organization. Right? That wasn't our plan. We weren't trying to make Greenpeace famous. We were trying to make in the and environment course, famous. <laughs> I mean, the thing about Greenpeace in the beginning was it was pretty grassroots, and, and it was, it, we didn't have any money, and it was all volunteers, and it was pretty crazy at times. But it wasn't just chaos. We were actually trying to think it through. You know, from the time of the first whale campaign in 1975, Greenpeace suddenly became instantly popular. Every time we were successful in making the nuclear weapons issue popular or making the whales popular or the seals popular, we also simultaneously made Greenpeace popular. And then people wanted to have Greenpeace offices all over the world. And, you know, our first response is, cool, <laughs> open them up. Well, now, you know, 40 years later, we take it for granted that there's, there's an environmental movement. And we also take it for granted that Greenpeace is this huge international organization. But we, we had no intention, really, of starting an international organization. The fact that Rex and, and the founders were journalists is a really important part of the whole narrative of Greenpeace 40 year history. Most of the movements stemmed because they didn't have communications people and didn't have media folks in the founding mm. tend to speak to themselves. Right, because you see the, the idea of direct action, which we got from the Quakers really and from Gandhi and from others, is the action has to speak for itself. When you get between a whaling boat and a whale, right, or when you sail a boat into a nuclear test zone, you want to create an action where anybody can see that photograph on the front page of their newspaper anywhere in the world and they can immediately understand what's, what's going on. Because remember, I mean, the whole idea is to go directly to the consciousness of the public. You have to say things in a way that is going to help the person digest the idea that you're trying to say. And humor is one of them better to look silly sometimes and to even mock yourself and go, oh, you know, there we go again, you know, doing some crazy stunt, you know. Because you, if you laugh at yourself, it helps other people take you seriously. It's like a reverse, like, it's like if you always take yourself too seriously, everybody else starts, starts getting skeptical. Like, you, 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 yeah, you should let other people take you seriously. Yeah, yeah, let you, should be, you should behave in a way. <laughs> no, Rex is absolutely right. You've got to behave in a way that others feel... Disarms them somewhat. Disarms yeah. them. I've been saying in lots of media work and so on that you know the struggle for environmental justice is not a popularity contest. Right. It's about speaking truth to power, it's about bearing witness to what's happening and it's about actually saying some really hard, uncomfortable facts such as We're here. the waters We're are going black, yeah. the trees are disappearing, yeah. the fish are, you know, gone, either yeah. contaminated, gone or, or poisoned. And when you put that kind of reality on the table, it tells us that we have to actually go back to the prophecy of the warriors of the rainbow, right? You know, we have reached that. The prophecy right. is with us now. Right. But I do think we have to get better at making the environmental struggle a social struggle. We have to break the dichotomy that the agenda of environmental justice is in contradiction with the agenda of social and economic justice. Right. If we talked about defending forests 10 years ago, in a lot of the imagination, it was about biodiversity, tree huggers, people yeah. who love trees yeah, just yeah. for the sake of the beauty of the trees. Now that's legitimate in itself, yeah, yeah. but if we speak about defending the forest as critical to the livelihoods of people right. in the forest, Their critical use. for the, uh, the lungs yeah. of the planet, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it affects everybody, yeah, yeah. then you can actually build a broader narrative yeah. that more people yeah. feel that they are stakeholders in the struggle. Yeah. And yeah. If we had, you know, 100,000 local groups, they could be talking about what actions they can take on the environment in their communities, what actions they can take to lobby the local government. We have to not simply think out of the box, we must chuck the bloody box away and think in a very different way. The fact is, we have seen throughout even our own lifetimes and well as human history, that we can actually go through these social transformations, which at one point we thought impossible. We've been talked about Gandhi, we've talked about the women's movement, we've talked about the civil rights movement and so forth. Before these movements happened, they seemed impossible. 
So sometimes it takes, you know, centuries of people organizing around an idea, and then suddenly it happens, and it happens quickly. So this is where I hold out, out hope. Thank you.